views expressed in this episode of Catalyst are not intended as medical advice. Please consult with your doctor regarding your medications. We've been told that medications to lower cholesterol will save lives. We repeatedly hear from patients that their doctors tell them, if you don't take this, you will die. Over 40 million people worldwide take drugs to lower their cholesterol. But now there's evidence that the majority of them won't benefit. None of those people are less likely to die. I speak to doctors accusing the drug companies of distorting the evidence about the drug's side effects. Of course they're going to try to minimize the adverse events because that will increase the sales of their drugs. In its effect, it's certainly scientific fraud. And it, in its effect, it's organized crime. So how do these drugs work? And are they really safe? I've come to the United States to investigate how drugs to lower cholesterol came to be the most widely prescribed drugs in the history of medicine. The 80s saw the debut of a new weapon in the battle against heart disease, a novel class of drugs called statins that lowered cholesterol like no other medication before them. They were heralded as nirvana, the next great thing, because all of a sudden now you're getting 30 to 40% reduction with statins, which was huge. And this was great news to the people who were pushing the cholesterol theory because they said, aha, now we don't have to settle for these piddling little amounts anymore. We can really show how important cholesterol is by knocking it way down. Medical information comes along that says you may need to get... In the US, influential more. TV ads like this now, use popular actors well, to boast the enormous the potential of these drugs. Crestor, along with diet, can lower bad cholesterol by up to 52%. But the reality is, lowering your cholesterol with medication doesn't guarantee you won't have a heart attack. The marketing concentrates on the fact that you can lower your cholesterol as if that was the end in itself, which it is not. Cholesterol is just a lab number, you know. Who cares about lowering cholesterol unless it actually translates into a benefit to patients? Over the decades, drug companies have had an enormous vested interest in statin drugs. It's the most profitable group of drugs in the history of the world. Something like 15 to 25 billion, with a B, dollars per year spent on these drugs. So it's higher than the gross national product of many countries around the world. Lipitor is the best-selling drug in history. So in terms of costs, total sales of Lipitor have been in the range of $140 billion since it came on the market in 1996. Statins work by disabling a critical step early in the formation of cholesterol. There's a pathway that produces cholesterol in the body. You can think of it like a tree. So we have decided collectively that one of the branches of this tree is bad, meaning cholesterol. So we've decided that the best way to get rid of that branch is to cut the tree off at the root. Statins inhibit this enzyme, which is also required for essential molecules like coenzyme Q10. Nutritionist Dr. Johnny Bowden says CoQ10 is essential for optimal heart muscle function. This is partly we believe why so many side effects have to do with lack of energy, um, muscle pain, because coenzyme Q10 is so vital. So what's the irony of giving people a drug to reduce something that probably doesn't even have that much to do with heart disease that also reduces one of the molecules that's most necessary for heart health? How insane is that? It's assumed that cholesterol is a toxic substance in your body and getting it as low as you can is a good thing. Well, cholesterol is the organic molecule that's most common in your brain by weight. It's in every cell wall. It's the precursor of many of the hormones in our bodies. It's an enormously complex molecule. And to think that you can radically pull this out of the body 
and not have consequences is just, it's ridiculous. It's such bad science. It's been about 30 years since statins were first introduced as the new blockbuster drug in heart disease, and millions of people around the world are being prescribed these medications. But many are concerned that the benefits of these drugs have been grossly exaggerated. <laughs> Professor Rita Redberg is a world-renowned cardiologist. She says barring a genetic condition, the only people who live longer by taking a statin are those that have already had a heart attack or stroke. That's working great. That's good. Yeah. And of them, only a very small number will benefit. One or two people in a hundred will benefit from taking a statin. What people don't understand is that means the other 98 will get no benefit at all. It's not going to reduce their chance of dying. But this hasn't limited their use. These drugs are now being widely prescribed to relatively healthy people, those without diagnosed heart disease. And Dr. Redberg warns most of them won't benefit. For healthy people, even people that have a lot of risk factors, so they might have high blood pressure, they might smoke, they might have diabetes, the data is not there to suggest that those people are better off taking a stand. No, I don't think it's a wonder drug. Your chance but Dr. David Sullivan disagrees. He says all risk factors should be considered equally, including cholesterol. If you want to mount these arguments about not treating the cholesterol, you've got to take the responsibility of saying it's not necessary to treat these other risk factors either. I would certainly encourage people who are considering cessation of treatment for perceived side effects and so forth to discuss it with their doctor. In 2012, there was an interesting turn of events. The CTT collaboration, a highly regarded group of researchers, reanalyzed all of the old data with different methods and concluded that statins were effective for the wider population. The report was subject to harsh criticism, but it's still the data that many cardiologists turn to. The media jumped on board and reported that everyone over the age of 50 should be taking a statin to reduce their risk of heart disease, even if you had normal cholesterol. But Professor Redberg says there's a downside. None of those people are less likely to die. So you can take a statin for many, many years and you're just as likely to die as if you had not taken a statin. Unless you've already been diagnosed with heart disease, then taking a statin won't help you live longer. It may reduce your risk of a cardiovascular event, but it may also increase your risk of developing something else, like diabetes. Either way, taking a statin won't extend your lifespan. Dr Abramson says cardiologists are so focused on how these drugs prevent blood vessel disease, they often overlook the other problems caused by statins. People are more than their cardiovascular system. And what we really want to do is improve people's overall health, longevity, and their risk of serious illness. If you look at overall health, we haven't done anything for them. Now, do people want to take a statin to trade one cardiovascular event for some other very serious illness, in other words, no net benefit, and expose themselves to the risk of harm from the statins. Do you want to do that? I think it's a bad deal. If somebody has a particular fear of heart disease and says, look, I don't care if I get diabetes. I, I don't care if I have muscle symptoms. I don't care if I can't exercise the way I want to exercise. I do not want to have heart disease. Fine. A statin, but understand that that's why you're taking a statin, not because it's going to improve your overall health. Cardiologist Dr. Ernest Curtis says the absolute benefit of statins is so minor that it's unlikely to be because of their ability to lower cholesterol. He says statins probably work through other mechanisms. It seems very likely that the amount of reduction that they saw with the statin agents could easily be due to its effect on the blood clotting and possibly even the anti-inflammatory effect and have nothing to do with the cholesterol. Dr. Galom has scrutinized the data and she's even more skeptical about the value of these drugs, especially in women. 
Right now, the evidence has not supported benefit to women, even if they have heart disease, in terms of mortality and all-cause morbidity. It has not shown benefit to elderly, even if they have heart disease. In fact, in the 4S trial, there was a 12 percent increase in mortality in the women in that group who were assigned to statin rather than placebo. So the evidence really doesn't support that the benefit is the same for women and for men. And on top of that, women are at higher risk of complications from statins. Should women take cholesterol-lowering medication? In general, no. Now, there may be exceptions. Medicine actually does have an element of art. And if women are from a family with severe familial hyperlipidemia, where a lot of people are dying from heart disease in their 30s and 40s, that's a group where I would say there is an art. There are now calls for patients to give written consent before taking a statin. If you do plan to give statins to women, to elderly, to people at low risk, they should sign a consent form saying they understand that they're receiving a drug that will not extend their life, but will only shift the cause of death. I think patients have a right to know that before they agree to take on a medication. The National Heart Foundation of Australia agrees that people are being prescribed statins unnecessarily. I would agree that there are people in, a, in Australia today who are being treated for cholesterol where their cardiovascular risk is not high. And you would have to question whether they should in fact actually be on that. A report estimated around 75% of people taking statins are in the low to moderate risk category. And according to these researchers, that means up to 30 million people are taking a drug that won't offer them the benefit of living any longer. My doctor pointed out that my cholesterol levels were high and I should take some sort of medication to reduce the uh, cholesterol level. There was nothing wrong with Edward's health, apart from his high cholesterol. He took his doctor's advice and began taking a statin. After about two weeks, I was having a difficult time walking in the daytime, and at night I had trouble sleeping. My legs ached. I was definitely experiencing a memory loss. Uh, I, I didn't feel as that I could recall things as clearly as I did before I was taking the statin. Statins have a long list of side effects like muscle weakness, memory loss, and in rare cases, a potentially fatal condition called rhabdomyolysis, where muscles break down and cause kidney failure. Edward decided to stop taking his medication. I start feeling better after about three weeks to maybe a month afterwards. How long did it take for you to get 100% improvement? 100% better took from the time I stopped taking the statins, took six months. They feel like they're in a fog, they can't get out of their chair. Side effects that go away when they've stopped their statins. And I have patients come in and tell me they'd rather be dead than keep taking the statin. Some of them tell us that their doctors fire them as patients if they just continue their statins, which I really wonder about the ethics of. Some of the people that we hear from also say that their doctor didn't believe them, that their problem couldn't be due to statins, and based on how patients perceive it, badger or bully them into resuming or continuing the medication. That's not an acceptable way for medicine as a system to be run. But Dr Sullivan says it's possible that patients talk themselves into having side effects. In alerting patients to uh, some undesirable possibilities and in fact maybe even through the power of suggestion lead them to believe that they're experiencing those particular issues uh, which they would then blame on the drug when in fact it might be uh, arising from other factors. Their imagination? Um, look, I'd be reluctant to... Uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot of these things aren't imagined. I think there are days when you can feel more of a muscle, muscle ache than, than others, and it can be age, it can be all sorts of other things. 